So hello, my name is Ryan McDonald, as already has been told. My supervisor is Dr. Stephen Smith, and I'd like to talk to you about uh, our work in reactive motion planning in uncertain environments. I'd like to motivate our work, first of all, by a simple example where the robot starts at a position S, we'd like to move to a position G, but there's a set of obstacles in the way, and those set of obstacles have a certain set of constraints. And so here, if obstacle one exists, and obstacle two does not, and if obstacle two exists, and obstacle one does not. So what are some possible solutions you might be able to come up with? What about avoiding the obstacles? And yes, that might be possible, but we're also interested in cases when that's not possible. So how about we learn the obstacles? So you can see here the robot drives up to obstacle two, senses it, figures out it doesn't exist, so then it continues on to the goal. But we're not interested in a lot of computation post learning something in the environment. So we'd like whatever controls the, the robot uh, to also handle the case when it measures O2 to be obstructed. So our environment is formulated over a directed graph. We have two edge weights. There's an edge weight to move and there's an edge weight to observe. Throughout this talk, we'll be using a grid world where the robot can move and observe up and down and left and right. And we'll model obstructions using a little red bar with a black border around it. And obviously the robot can't traverse over an obstruction. So there's a set of possible environments and one particular is drawn from at random, and that is realizing the particular environment the robot is functioning in. And so you, the robot knows all of the environments and the probability distribution, but doesn't know the particular random draw. So the robot state is formulated over a belief and a position. And so for this example here, you can see that the, it believes it could be environment one, environment two, environment three. It hasn't learned anything different, and its initial position is S. We allow the robot to move over unobstruct, unobstructed edges, and this is important. If the robot wanted to continue straight up, it couldn't do so until it updated its belief because environment one and environment two both have that edge blocked and they're both contained in the belief. We do allow it to update its belief by observing an outgoing edge from its current position. So it pays the observation cost and is returned its state. I'll go into a little bit more detail of how it updates the belief in a, little, in a few slides. So I'd like to talk first of all about a policy. So a policy maps a belief in a position to an outgoing edge from that position and an indication whether the robot should move or observe that edge. We're not interested in policies in general, we're interested in complete policies and these policies will always reach the goal when it's possible and it'll identify when it's impossible to reach the goal. So finally we're at a place where we can define the problem. So the reactive planning problem give, is given a set of environments, a probability distribution over those environments and to start in a goal. The robot doesn't know the particular realization. And you have to ask the question, can you find a complete policy that minimizes the expected cost? And we take the cost to be the sum of observation and movement costs. So we prove in the paper this is an NP-hard problem. But not only that, we're not interested in a mapping from a belief in a position that could be quite cumbersome. We want something a little bit more tangible, something more understandable. So first we should talk about observations and how they update beliefs and that will naturally lead to our encoding of a policy. So we'll classify an observation as constructive if it partitions the belief. Why? And you can see here our example, I'm just going to continue with the same observation, we'll call it O1. If it's obstructed, that agrees with environment 1 and environment 2. And if it's unobstructed, that agrees with environment 3. You can see this partitioning happening. Suppose we want to continue partitioning the obstructed case and you could do so, we'll call that O2. And here's an example here. And if we code that into a policy, that becomes a binary tree. And this extends the work from Zen Lim. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. So we encode it. Our encoding uses edges to be a sequence of move actions. And the observations are constructive observations. And the robot knows which particular edge to take after the outcome of an observation. So this elicits two important properties for us. First of all, policy is deterministic. And second, the look up for the next action can be done in constant time. And this is interesting for us because a few of our applications have real-time constraints. So we prove there is an optimal policy of this form and also that we can encode it with a, within a polynomial amount of uh, space within the input. So that's very exciting for us. But how do we actually come up with a policy instead of just randomly grabbing observations? Obviously the problem is NP-hard, so we're not going to find a, a perfect solution in polynomial time, so let's uh, develop our, our uh, solution. So we, take, we combine two perspectives. First of all, we take an information perspective. We identify the reachable constructive observations. We'll denote that RV. 
And so these are the observations the robot can get to without crossing over an edge that may be obstructed. And we use mutual information to define the quality of an observation with respect to the belief. But we also have to consider cost. Obviously, we're minimizing over the cost. So for this case, you have the cost to move to the observation, to make the observation. But you can think of cases very quickly where it will diverge away from the goal. We don't want that. So we introduce our notion of expected cost to go. And this is used as an underestimator on the expected cost, not the cost, expected cost from a current position to the goal. And it's a pictorial example of how we calculate it, but for time's sake, I won't explain that. Rather, I'll tell you the two applications we use it for. So first of all, we use it to lower bound the expected cost of any policy. So that can tell us how relatively good we have uh, for a solution. And also, perhaps more importantly, we use it to rule out non-optimal observations. So we introduce an observation pruning condition. And so that allows us to make sure that we don't choose non-optimal observations. So finally, the combination we use is weighted conditional entropy. So we take the reachable observations, which has been pruned. The cost is the cost to get to the observation, the cost to make it, and the expected cost to go. We multiply that by the conditional entropy, which gives us the importance of an observation. So just as a quick overview of the algorithm, so we start with a robot, a state, a Q of robot states. We DQ a state. We check the termination conditions. This ensures the policy is complete. And let's assume it's not, so we can continue with this example. So we find the reachable observations. We prune it. And here's an example here. We find the minimizer using the weighted conditional entropy. We add the move actions and the observation to the policy tree. Because we know a constructive observation partitions the belief, we have two outcoming robot states, and we add those back into the queue. So here's our simulation. We dealt with a flexible factory. And we, have, we developed four policies within this space, one from inventory to loading A, and another back, one from inventory to loading B, another back. I don't know if you can see this, but from here to here. And so the red defines ob obstructions. And uh, there's a certain set of constraints, but I won't go into the details. There's a few less than 35,000 different environments that are possible. There's uh, 48 vertices and 150 edges. And so our solution for each policy, we could find it within approximately 10 minutes on an i7 core. That gives you some relative sense of the time. And our expected cost was within, always within 30% of, of the optimal expected cost, in some cases even better. I'd like to reiterate one last time that a policy is deterministic. And you can see here for one simple uh, set of obstructions, policy is a path. But if any of these observations had different outcomes, you could expect an alteration to this path. So for dirty laundry, first of all, I think anybody who was listening at all realizes I can't build an ideal sensor, so that all of a sudden it seems like all the work falls apart. Um, and we'll address that in a second. You can't handle unknown environments. So if the robot runs into something that hasn't been given prior, what does it do? In this case, it doesn't handle that. Also, the lower bound is not proven tight. So after this paper is accepted, we continued on with our work. We developed a faulty sensor model, so that allows a, an incorrect measurement, and the robot can handle that with a relative ease extension from this work. And perhaps more importantly, our, our main goal, and this is just the technical background that we needed to proceed with our goal, is learning the environment. So we have some results on that. We're testing them currently. But this is where no prior data is needed. And I hope maybe a lot of people can appreciate that that makes a lot more sense. I don't want to encode 35,000 possible environments. So this allows us to, for the robot to learn obstacles and links between them, harness that to better a policy as it goes on. We have an incremental update to a policy. And you, hopefully you'll see some work on that very soon. I'd like to thank our funding. And at this time, I'd like to ask for questions. Um, so I guess I'll take advantage of my position to ask questions. Actually, my first question was going to be, is there a clear way to extend this to a case where the sensor is uncertain? So yes. can you just give us a hint about that? Uh, yes. So you have to uh, just address the robot model. And so for that, we just include, uh, give a probability that the sensor will be incorrect, one for false positive, one for false negative. And then we have to address uh, how the robot can uh, across an edge. So we retract the fact that it can't across uh, an edge that's obstructed, but we allow it to test. And if it can't get across, it's returned to initial position. And if it can, it'll make it all the way to the end. So you can kind of think of that as maybe a high-level sensor and maybe just a touch sensor where the robot goes, oh, there's an obstacle there and I can't continue. I see. Okay, cool. Um, and I, did, I just can't resist this remark. Since you're from Canada, yes. I sort of expected a discussion of how this relates to the Canadian traveler's problem. 
Do you know that? I do know that problem. Um, I haven't thought about that. That's a really good okay, point. Okay, I have, but we can talk later. Okay, so, thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions? Like the position. position. Yeah, we assume the position is complete localization so, within the space. Uh, then could you elaborate a little on like, what is the position, position of the robot was not known, but it was uncertain. And what is it? You have like a multimodal hypothesis. So that's good. How to test the belief depends on where you think you are. Yeah, that's actually a really excellent point, and that's on my wish list. But um, I'm we're kind of getting close for time, and I haven't actually g had a chance to go down, but that's definitely something on my wish list. Uh, question kind of in the back there. Oh, no, you with your hand up. So um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about trying to scale this up into three-dimensional space given your results so far. Is that something you've tried and can you comment on how well this does or doesn't scale or things like that? Um, it's a directed graph, so if it's a discrete environment. So all of our work extends directly to to uh, directed graph. So if you can model it adequately, and because the obstructions are edges, I don't want to ramble on for too long, but because they're edges, you can consider a vast amount of space as a vertex and making between these spaces as edges. So I think you could extend it to a three-dimensional space. I haven't actually thought about it, so you, you might have a point. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Uh, one last question right there. There's uh, some algorithms that uh, induce curiosity-driven exploration by rewarding information gain. Uh, they usually use an additive informational term, whereas you do the most specific one. Yes. That's an excellent point, and I was, uh, I was wondering if someone was going to mention that. So we don't have a, a concrete example to say that this is the perfect combination of uh, the weight perspective and the information perspective. All I'll say is we found some research that supported using this particular uh, mul multiplicative idea, and for us, uh, we don't have any particular po properties. We also don't claim on it being optimal, so that might be the case. We're interested in doing some experimental, maybe more so testing on different combinations of those metrics. But yeah, it's a very good point. All right, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.